third presentation, oh, you're mic'd up, that's great, is uh, from Professor Sonia Johnson, who's Professor of Social and Community Psychiatry, and she's going to talk about social psychiatry, evidence-based policy. So over to okay. you, Sonia. All right. This is, in fact, my title. And what I'm going to focus on is we're obviously still waiting for great leaps forward to improve patient prognosis that come from neuroscience. Hopefully the Institute of Mental Health will achieve those. And we're still hoping, and I'd suggest we should still be advocating for social and political change. In the meantime, what can we, as researchers on mental health care, achieve? So the prognosis of severe mental health problems like psychosis and bipolar has probably not improved at all in the past few decades, as far as we can see from literature reviews. And that's a real contrast with diseases like cancer or cardiovascular disease, where there have been considerable improvements in prognosis. We can look ahead, hopefully, at potential approaches to early intervention and prevention, but there are many people in this country and around the world who are already living with severe conditions for whom it's much too late for prevention, for early intervention, but not too late to try and do something to prevent, to improve their lives and to improve the care they get. So what I'm going to give you a lightning tour of is four potential approaches to turning the tide towards things actually getting better for people with severe mental health problems. And I'm going to illustrate those with some of the research that my colleagues and I are undertaking in the Division of Psychiatry and other linked departments to, in adult mental health. Okay, so the first thing we can try and do is to implement the things that we know work. There's quite a strong argument that actually we should stop developing anything new and just try and get people to actually do the things that have an evidence base. So we've known for 50 years that family intervention improves prognosis in psychosis, and yet we also know that fewer than 10% of potentially eligible people in the NHS actually get those family interventions. Crisis teams have been embedded in the NHS for the last 15 years. We know from research that they can reduce admissions to hospital and make people considerably more satisfied with their treatment, and yet we know that they don't do that in practice, that their national rollout has probably not reduced admissions, and that nationally people are pretty unhappy with the care they get. So the first is an example of lack of implementation, the second of poor quality implementation, both of models that we know could work. We know that just telling people what to do through policy, local service planning, doesn't work. It's not enough. So what we can do as researchers, I'd suggest, is to work on defining and measuring what good practice is and developing and testing methods to implement what we know will help people. So examples of this are a program that's run over the last few years in the Division of Psychiatry called the CORE program, in which we've worked on a fidelity scale to try and describe what crisis teams should be doing. We found when we initially la looked nationally that there were no crisis teams that were actually achieving what we defined as good practice across the board. We developed a method for helping them achieve that and have found that that is associated with a substantial reduction in hospital admissions. Another example of improving implementation and the, in, of implementing what we know works is the work by Helen Kilaspi, who's recently won a European prize for her work on improving quality in rehabilitation care and supported housing. What else can we do? If you look at, if you meet a community mental health nurse, in this country for a clinical encounter. 
it's quite likely that you'll have a good chat if there's time, but what you won't get is any kind of, very often, is any kind of structured intervention that's got an, an evidence base. So except perhaps in clinical psychology, the care we, we deliver tends to be poor in structured and evidence-based interventions. So there's a need for us to try and enrich the fabric of mental health care across the NHS with interventions that are acceptable, can be used cross-culturally, can be delivered not just by highly specialised people but by a wide range of staff, maybe by peer researchers as well, and that are effective and cost-effective. And there's quite a lot around that has potential in this field that's somewhat developed but needs more. These are some of the kind of areas where it would be highly beneficial to have tools for everyday use. So examples in this area, I'm going to be showing this slide for a very long time because it's peer support research published in the actual Lancet, which is a bit of a first for me and, and lots of people. We found we developed a simple self-management tool for relapse prevention crisis planning. It was delivered by peer support workers after a crisis and it resulted in a 10% reduction in readmissions. Another example of work that enriches the fabric of everyday care is the work that David Osborne has been involved in on physical health care and in smoking cessation. Similarly, work that can enrich what we deliver to patients every day. But we can develop new interventions as well. We've discussed already that there's a very well-established relationship, probably a, one that goes in both directions, between mental illness and ver various kinds of social adversity. Yet, if you look in the NICE guidelines for psychosis or depression, they advocate very few social interventions. Most of what's advocated people get is pharmacological or psychological. So as well as looking at societal level for change, there are also opportunities to try and intervene at an individual level with the social aspects of people's lives. Obviously, we don't want to paper over the cracks and kind of disguise social change, but I think it's not all about trying to achieve societal change. There are things we can do while we wait for that. And one potential focus that there's great interest in now is loneliness. So loneliness is a subjective and distressing lack of connections, very strongly associated with lots of mental health problems, probably has various different forms. It's probably not an epidemic, but it is quite common. We tend to think we're a uniquely lonely nation, but actually we're somewhere in the middle. And there are lots of potential intervention from psychological treatment, social prescribing, the arts. There are all sorts of things one can do at an individual as well as a societal level. And we have a new network, which I hope is a sort of paradigm for the kind of cross-disciplinary collaboration that hopefully will flower in the new Institute of Mental Health. This is us being not at all lonely at our launch event in Windsor Great Park with people from all these backgrounds and more, historians and philosophers and all sorts of fascinating people. And we're aiming through this network to achieve a step change in this field. It also includes a very active group of people with lived experience of mental health problems. And if this sounds interesting, please join us. We're trying to expand this network all the time. Okay, fourth thing we can do, and finally, is try and get what we know into policy. People tend to find something and then shrug their shoulders and say the policymakers don't care, they won't be interested. But actually, often, the civil servants, if not the politicians, in fact are able and curious and interested to know what might work. But they struggle with timescales for us producing research, with difficulty getting answer to the particular questions that they have. They also struggle with always being told that findings are negative and that more research is inevitably needed. 
So what can we do? Well, we have a policy unit. We now have a unit that's led from the Division of Psychiatry at UCL, includes people across the Faculty of Brain Sciences and beyond, that is intended to supply evidence to inform policy, hopefully within timescales that policymakers can use. And this has just had its first test in that we carried out the research to inform the independent review of the 1983 Mental Health Act that reported a couple of months ago. We managed to do nine studies in a year, six of them now published, and had a number of interesting findings that have informed policy, including that there is no evidence that compulsory community treatment actually reduces compulsory admissions. The only thing that does seems to be advanced statements and crisis plans. So that has gone into that report. So in conclusion, what can we do now? Several things. Don't let's be complacent. So people tend to look at neuroscientists and shake their heads and say, well, nothing has actually improved. All the work you've done, there have been no great leaps forward. But actually, we social psychiatrists should have been producing those great leap forward, leaps forward and improvements in prognosis as well. And it's not clear that we have, not so far. Against us are all these social factors and factors to do with funding, with quality of care, but there are potential ways to do better, pay great attention to implementation, work with everyone who's relevant, work with people who have lived experience, choose our methods carefully. A trial isn't always the best way forward. Sometimes there are quicker and different routes. We need to test really convincing interventions that we have really good reason to think may change. And finally, of course, we need more people and more money. Thank you. Thanks, Sonia. And these are Very good. some of my collaborators okay. in, this, in this work. Okay. Excellent. I'm not completely sure where we are with time, but we're just going to go with the flow. Uh, and uh, any comments or any, any questions for Sonia, or would you prefer to keep them for wine later? Fine. The wine has it. Sonia, thank you very much.